Aloha everybody. I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to give this talk on how I manage my type 1 diabetes. My name is David Dykeman. In this seminar, I'm going to give a detailed account of my type 1 diabetes management strategy, which is mainly based off of Dr. Bernstein's very low carb protocol, um, which I've been following for about seven years in rigorous detail, and I give insight into the nuts and bolts of the strategy, for which I've consistently attained low blood sugars and A1Cs below 5, with very low variation. I will also share new data from others who follow the strategy, including information regarding insulin usage, diet, and more. So a little bit about me. I'm 17 and a junior at Punahou School in Honolulu. I've worked as Dr. Bernstein's intern for Diabetes University since I was about 11 years old. Um, my use of personal video accounts and social media was an inspiration for the Facebook group called Type 1 Grit. Uh, this led to the highly notable Harvard study published in Pediatrics which demonstrated remarkable glycemic control in a large cohort of type 1 diabetics. I am a feature writer for the online magazine, A Sweet Life, and have written articles on the physics of insulin dosing and best strategies to perform rigorous athletic activity as a type 1 diabetic such as myself. I am also a very passionate advocate for type 1 diabetes management. I have spoken at many children's hospitals, universities, and conferences. I am working to address the health inequality issues via the development of a diabetes curriculum currently. So the outline of my talk is I'm going to go through my diagnosis story, kind of the experience I had pre-diagnosis, post-diagnosis, the hospital experiences, what the doctors told me at the time, and then go through kind of post-diagnosis and my introduction to the Bernstein method. And I'll go through some of my personal motivations, so hopefully some of you guys can connect with that or, or draw something from that. Um, and then I'll go into the nuts and bolts of insulin and how I personally use it to, to, to cover meals. And then I'll talk a little bit about school and social life. Um, and then my strategy for athletics because I do play sports. And then at the end we have some data from other type 1 grit members. So pre-diagnosis, um, I always noticed that about a couple months before, I had a very sunken face. I couldn't really get out of the couch. I had a ton of uh, loss of energy and I was losing a lot of weight. Um, and at school, for the most part, my head would just be on my desk, even to the point where the teacher had to call our parents and, and, and kind of bring it to their attention. Um, so we took several visits to the pediatric uh, our doctor and that resulted into a misdiagnosis, which was very bad. Um, the advice that we were given was actually to drink a lot of milkshakes to regain weight because at that point I lost about 10 pounds. And that, as you could imagine, was probably the worst advice that we could have gotten. So following that, I became severely ill and stayed at home from school. And a <laughs> funny memory is that during that time, uh, I was just watching March Madness with my dad on the couch, even though I couldn't get up, uh, didn't have any energy. I had a great time watching March Madness. Um, but finally, I was able to walk around and the test revealed that I had type 1. So we got the call on Friday night and we went straight to the emergency room. And crazy story that happened there was I really didn't know what was going on at all at the time. I was too young, didn't know anything about type 1. Um, but we kind of burst through the doors and, and there was a huge lineup of people. Um, so we, we were thinking at the time that we were going to be there for probably hours and hours. But we were able to cut in front of everybody and go straight through and that's kind of the point where I thought that it was something serious um, and I was a little bit worried. So my hospital experience. So upon knowing my diagnosis of type 1, I got a visit by my endocrinologist um, and he kind of gave me the basics where you eat, you go up, you bolus, you go down, you should stay from this range to this range. At, at the time he said 70 to 180 um, and he said normal blood sugars were 70 to 110. Um, and he talked about how carbs would make your blood sugars rise and at the time knowing nothing I told my doctor and my dad um, I just want to eat carbs and that was um, kind of a weird thing to say but looking back on it I was probably 100% right um, but at the hospital we were given meals of pancakes, milk, juice, french fries and bananas which are pretty much all things that are a disaster for me now if I eat I, I go up to you know, blood sugars that are exponentially higher than they should be and, but my doctor was honest, and I know from a lot of your guys' personal experiences that you guys didn't have doctors like this at the time, and he said that if I retain high blood sugars for long periods of time, I'll suffer complications. And I didn't know what those complications were, but he, he explained it to my parents, I'm sure, and he was just a very honest person in that respect. 
post-diagnosis, we didn't really know about Bernstein. We didn't know about low carbs, um, but we initially followed the ADA guideline. And as you can see from my blood sugar graph on the right, it was a disaster. I was going up to 400 at the highest and down to 60 or 50 at the lowest. And it was just a roller coaster nonstop. You can't see a flat line in there. And on the pictures on the left are pictures of pretty much the ADA guidelines, you know, 30 to 45 grams each meal. Teens, it goes up to 60 to 75 grams each meal, which is a disaster. And bottom left is kind of a picture of what the recommended diet would be, you know, sliced peaches, mashed potatoes, skim milk, low fat, all that stuff. So about one month post-diagnosis, we had the realization and epiphany that that retaining normal blood sugars or what we thought was normal at the time with high carb food and riding this roller coaster was impossible. So we were looking for anything or uh, any guidance and my mother actually found this Dr. Bernstein's Diabetes Solution book. So reading that, we all thought it just something clicked and it just made sense what he was saying. So after that, we immediately switched and got off of the roller coaster to a low carb, high protein diet and immediately saw improvements. And comparing this graph, which is about a month following the diabetes solution to the graph we showed in the last slide, it's tremendous the improvement we made. Still not great, but so much different, a completely other world than the other one. So about six months after my diagnosis, we've been following Dr. Bernstein's guide for about five months and we had truly gotten to the point where we would consider it normal blood sugars. Um, and then we were learning as we go, uh, including new insulin techniques, um, which all led to, to better blood sugars. And we even got to meet Dr. Bernstein, it was very cool for me because um, I, I honestly think that he was one of the main reasons, or if not the main reason why I'm able to, to be here and be so healthy right now. Um, and then you can see this graph six months from, from where I was, it's pretty much normal blood sugars. Still not as good as we are now, but very good nonetheless. So here are some of my motivations, goals, and some more results that I've had. So my main motivation is I just want to be normal. And I know that's, you know, sounds a lot of people, but not normal in the sense that I can eat a birthday cake with everybody else. Normal in the sense that I want to have the same blood sugars as everybody else and, and be able to do anything that anybody else can do. Uh, here's a picture of me and my high school football team. Um, and Callie, it's one of the guys. Um, and yeah, remove the awful feelings of hyper and hypoglycemia. Second motivation is to prevent complications. So like I mentioned earlier, my doctor was very honest about complications and he mentioned that they can start as early as the blood sugars rise from normal. Um, I know that Dr. Bernstein tests for about 100 different complications of elevated blood sugars. Um, and my main motivation is just, again, to be normal, be, motiv be, be a healthy kid, a uh, healthy adult, and that includes avoiding complications. So here are some important complications and examples that I'll give. So. Number one is damage to the child brain, which occurs within the current guidelines. So there's a study done and it showed that these results demonstrate that early onset type 1 diabetes has a widespread effect on the growth of gray and white matter into a children's whose blood glucose levels are well within a certain uh, current treatment from guidelines and then for the management of diabetes. So like I said, you know, if you're eating 60 for 75 grams of carbs a meal, your blood sugars are above a certain level, which they guaranteed will be if you do eat that, then you're at risk for this. Another one, uh, this chart shows that for retinopathy, um, neuropathy, all these different complications, you can see the risk for these diseases or complications immediately start to rise once you hit above a certain A1C threshold. So where I'm at is probably a 4.5, no risk at all for any of these. And when you go up to about a 6.5% A1C, the percentage is, is way higher than it was Another one that's very alarming to me shows that almost two decades of lost life for type 1 diabetic kids. This means that for, t for kids with type 1 diabetes that have these high blood sugars, their lifespan shortens probably t about 20 years. And I want to live a full life. I want to live a full healthy life. So this is something that I'm very much trying to avoid um, and that I am avoiding with Dr. Bernstein's method. So my goal, like I've stated multiple times, is that I want to achieve normal blood sugars. Um, and normal to me means average blood sugar within the 80s, um, which I've been consistently able to do for the last couple of years. 
um, very low standard deviation, which means I'm not on a roller coaster, and limit the hyper and hypoglycemia. So on this picture on the right is what you can see is a typical graph for me, low standard deviation, average within the 80, uh, 80s, um, and that's probably how I want it to be all the time, if not better. So since I've switched to Dr. Bernstein's method in 2013, I've consistently gotten A1Cs below 5. I don't think I've gotten one above 5 since that time. My average blood sugars have always remained in the 90 to 80 range. Like I said, low standard deviations and no severe hypos. Um, another cool story is Dr. Bernstein keeps my two graphs that we showed earlier in the slideshow um, that he shows to new pa uh, patients, which shows them that it can be done, it is very possible, and it is almost easy to some extent. So growth, I know a lot of questions I get um, is, oh, you're not eating you know, whole grain bread and, and, and um, different grain foods or carb foods. You, you must not be growing. Well, I'm 6'1". Um, I play quarterback at Punahou. I'm very healthy. Um, so I've seen no uh, high blood sugar stunt in growth, which you know I don't get high blood sugar, so it wouldn't be a problem, or any effects from not eating bread or grains or carbs. So a little quick note on ketones. I don't really worry about ketones that much. Um, my ketones are around 2.2 mm, uh, mm or so. Um, I eat plenty of protein, so I don't really expect them to be that elevated. But like I said, I don't really personally worry about ketones that much. So just a quick note there. So this is mainly the nuts and bolts section of how I personally manage it with such as insulin, you know, the meals I eat and the lifestyle I live. So in my diet, I have a strong emphasis on protein foods. Um, I eat a lot of also vegetables and nuts and other fibrous things. Um, one thing that's very cool is throughout this whole experience and, and connecting with other people who are following the Bernstein method, we've actually discovered a lot of great low carb treats that we can make like waffles, um, pancakes, all stuff that won't raise my blood sugar in the slightest way. So I enjoy eating those. And there's also a growing number of products um, that you can find even at Safeway and stuff, such as like low carb ice creams, um, different things that I enjoy. Um, mainly I stick to a meal plan because I want to remove the roller coaster possibility. Um, and yeah, my hunger dictates my food quantities. I'm a growing child. Um, for long day of sports, I want to eat a lot more and that will dictate my insulin intake, um, depending on how many grams of protein I'll eat for that. And carbs pretty much consistently remain under 30 grams a day. Um, my protein is around two grams per body weight or per pound of body weight. So probably about around 300 carbs a day or 300 grams of protein a day. Um, and I don't really force meals of fat. If I eat fat, I eat fat. If I don't, I don't. But I'm not looking for that in my diet. So this is a quick slide just to show that there's a delicious low carb alternative to any high carb meal. Um, this isn't even showing the majority of the, the 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 pastries that you can make with things such as almond flour, which there's hundreds of them. But these are just some great meals, typical meals that I would probably eat um, for lunch, breakfast, or dinner. Um, this is my bottom line. There's no deprivation. Um, in my experience, there's been a delicious low carb alternative to any high carb meal. Um, the only difference is that you won't go to 180 and then crash down to 50. And this is my basal bolus management. Um, with a very low carb diet. So most of the insulin I'm given at, at meals is to cover grounds of protein, um, which will raise your blood sugar, but not to the extent that carbs will. They're very different. Um, so I use an um, intermediate acting insulin called Regular or R. It's very cheap. Um, I found we mainly get it at Walgreens or Walmart. So I also have a very diverse set of low carb uh, high protein meals that I know how to bolus for properly through trial and error mainly. But once again, the risk is not there where if you bolus wrong or guess wrong, you're not going to go up to 150, you'll go up to 110 at the most. So R is, as Dr. Bernstein says, it's impossible to consistently match the sharp piece of high carb foods with sharp piece of rapid insulin. So with the food that we're eating, it's going to be steady rises, um, not sharp peaks as you would if you ate uh, high carb meals. So R is the best insulin for that because it matches the peak of what uh, people on Dr. Bernstein's guide would follow high protein, low carb meals. 
So this is kind of the formula that I go off of to uh, trial and error different meals or new meals that I'll be doing. So I mainly estimate the meal as one unit per eight grams of carb and one unit for 12 grams of protein. Although I rarely ever eat more than eight grams of carb per meal. So if I go high and come back down after a meal, next time I'll pre-bowl this a little bit. If I go high and stay high, I'll know that I need more insulin. If I go low and then I come up, less pre-bolus. If I go low and stay low, less insulin. So this is the trial and error method. Like I said in the slide before, the risk is not really there. If you mess up, you're not gonna suffer like you would if you messed up in the insulin dosage if you're eating um, you know, pancakes or, or cupcakes or, or potatoes or whatever you would eat on a normal high carb meal. So these are two differences, um, examples of different meals from a low carb, high tea, high protein diet and a high carb, low protein diet. Picture on the right again is from the ADA guideline that we showed earlier. This is about 67 grams of carbs, um, 25 grams of protein, 20 grams of fat. Um, the meal on the left is almost double the protein, double the fat with um, about you know 60 less carbs um, with zero rapid carbs. Same amount of calories, but the one on the left will not raise your blood sugar, it requires half the insulin, and the other one will require rapid insulin. This one, like I said earlier, requires R, matching the peaks. Um, basal insulin. I use Loving Me about three times a day and recently switched to Traceba. Um, I've split my dose of Traceba two times a day, uh, one dose at night, one dose when I wake up in the morning. My daily dose has varied from you know, where I started using Traceba to where I am now, because I am in puberty, I am growing, I have a lot of hormones, stuff like that. So at age 16 and a half was where I am now. It probably dropped around 24 units a day. Um, at the most, where I was at, it was at probably 36 units to a day during my main stages of puberty. Um, but yes, like I said, it varies due to growth. Um, I determine my morning and evening uh, dose based on the last six hours after injecting. If I'm going low around 2 a.m., then I'll probably decrease it the next day, and so forth. Correcting highs and lows. So in the very rare occasion that I do go low or high, um, I'll probably just take a um, dextrose powder, mix it with water, and I'll go up pretty instantly to where I want to be. Um, and this is just another example of, of something that I wanted to, to put in here, which is that CGMs are not always uh, accurate, and you can't always 100% trust them. As you can see, this graph is very scattered, um, shows very inconsistent numbers. You know, it's going off for most of the time. So don't always trust CGMs, always finger stick when you can, um, or regularly. You don't have to finger stick every 10 minutes, but you get the point. High blood sugars, I frequently use an IM shot um, with rapid acting insulin, not R, rapid acting. So as you can see in the graph to the right, I'll go up to around, this is like, 120, which is probably the highest I'll ever get, or that might even be 110. Um, and then you'll see I have a decline, and it's steady. There's no roller coaster. I'm not tanking to below 60. I'm going to 110 to, to 70, and that's the worst it'll get. And then again, um, that's another CGM fail that we had in this graph, which is just to hammer home my point that CGMs are not always trustworthy. Low blood sugars, like I said earlier, I'll correct around 70 or below, or below 70. So I always treat it with glucose, but I honestly prefer liquid glucose. It, it, it probably goes a lot faster, I've noticed. So I, I've almost never had a severe low because like I said, with this, you're removing the possibility of a roller coaster where you can't go down that fast with the stuff you're eating and the insulin dosages you're giving. So opposed from people that are on a high carb diet, I wouldn't be in the 50s or 40s um, down from like the 180s. So this is just a picture of the liquid glucose that I use. I uh, determined kind of a method as how much to give, so one scoop if I'm below that and that will raise me 15 points, and so on and so forth, depending on your weight. So school and social life, um, it's I, I find it to be very common that different kids will be on different diets, you know, vegetarians, vegans, pescatarians, so I've noticed for the most part my friends don't really care what I eat. Um, if I'm at a party and it's someone's grilling, I'll just have a hot dog with no bun, no one cares. Hamburger, no bun, no one cares. Pizza, take out the cheese, eat, eat the topping only, no one cares. Drink a Diet Coke, no one cares. Um, and I take pre-filled syringes um, and are with me just in case I ever do eat. And at that point, I'll have already known the, the, the correct dose for those foods. So this is my strategy for sports and athletics. Um, I play 
football and basketball, both are very hard to manage because of the amount of exercise that I'm exerting and the, the adrenaline and whatnot affects your blood sugar. So what I've developed is I have pre-planned meals, um, pre-planned insulin doses to ensure normal blood sugars hours before the activity so there's no variation and I can focus on the sport and not my blood sugars. So I mainly try to avoid food and insulin before two hours before the sports because like I said, that will create a roller coaster. Even if you're on a low carb diet and you're taking huge amounts of insulin and eating huge amounts of foods before a game, you're gonna, you're gonna raise your blood sugars high because of the adrenaline you're exerting and then crash them low because once you're after exercise, your body's just gonna absorb all that. And then I just plan and warm up like any other athlete. I focus on my sport and I don't really have to worry about my diabetes if I'm doing this. Post game is a little bit tricky sometimes. Um, basal in, uh, insulin will probably be decreased because of the amount of exercise I do. Um, my post game recovery strategy is spent is to to make up the calories that I lost and keep my basal constant. Um, and I try very hard to avoid post game lows. So I probably eat two meals of protein and fats just to keep blood sugars from going low. I'll probably bolus less than I would normally post game. And sometimes I make an energy shake, which is a very high calorie. Um, cream, protein powder, and it's kind of a smoothie kind of thing. So towards the end of this, I wanted to show some new data from Type 1 Grit, um, which is the group of a bunch of low carbers that are following the same method that I'm doing. So this is just uh, the, to show the pediatrics paper that was published in 2018 um, by a lot of doctors, Dr. Blinn and Lenertz, um, Anna Barton, just to name a few. Richard K. Bernstein was a part of it. So it showed that that for us, type 1 diabetics, they studied about 300, uh, 300 diabetics. Um, carb intake was around 20 to 50 grams per day. Average A1C was 5.57. Uh, um, and, and they found out that carb intake was the only predictor of H1C. Um, so yeah, most of the people, about 97, had better um, uh, glycemic control than, than the ADA targets um, supplied. And a great quote from this um, is that their blood sugars seemed almost too good to be true from Dr. Blinn and Lenertz, um, who was the lead author of the study and the instructor in the Division of Pediatric Endocrinology at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Um, it's nothing we typically see in the clinic for type 1 diabetes, which is very true. And again, here's just some polls. There's a Traceva poll, an injection poll, glucose poll, um, how many people use the, the 15 gram rule for corrections, how many use IM shots, how many split basal doses, um, has your child uh, condition improved or declined since transitioning to low carb. Just some interesting little tidbits. So the first one is about honeymoon. Honeymoon phase is, is where you don't really need as much insulin when you're first diagnosed. Um, and you can see that the majority of people will actually continue in this honeymoon phase for a little bit where they need less insulin. Um, very few people had to have no insulin for a few months. Um, very few people had to have no insulin for over a year. Um, and then a little bit more people had or never had a honeymoon effect. Treating hyperglycemia, um, I would recommend using liquid glucose or glucose. Food is kind of too slow and you might get into the range where you have to end up bolusing for that food. So as you can see, almost 92% of the gritters actually use liquid glucose or glucose. And the majority of, of, of gritters use regular insulin, which is the one that I use to cover low-carb meals. Um, small, small, uh, small minority of them don't. A lot of the gritters also split basal. Um, what I'm using is Triceba. Um, I'm actually in the minority here where I'm using two doses still. The majority of the Triceba users actually use one. Um, Lantus, more people use two. And Lovemir, it's kind of a three-way split but the majority of them use two doses. And this is just for pump users. I don't personally use a pump. I used to, I got off of it. I prefer not using a pump anymore. Um, but you can see that multiple pump, uh, pumps is required for, for most meals for pump users. This is a pretty interesting one. Um, going back to my experience, I was not recommended uh, a low carb diet and you can see that's extremely rare even with gritters about two percent of them were recommended a low carb diet once they were diagnosed by the doctors 98 percent an overwhelming majority were were um, shown 
the high carb method and we're trying to get those numbers to be pretty much flipped almost. So this is a wrap up um, 2020 and beyond or 2021 we're in now I guess. Um, so I'm just going to continue my advocacy for type 1 diabetics. Um, this is just a picture of me speaking at Low Carb USA in 2015. I've been doing this for a while. I enjoy doing it. Um, I'm passionate about it and I'm going to continue. So my main message that I'm going to leave you off on is that diabetics are entitled to normal healthy blood sugars. Um, which is a message that I've been living by since I found Dr. Bernstein's book and how I'm sure the thousands of people on Type 1 Grit are also living by. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And now I'm going to answer a couple questions. Um, I know you guys haven't answered questions because it's online. Um, just in case you guys were uh, unclear about some things, I just wanted to kind of simulate questions just in case. So question one, what do you do when your friends are eating high carb foods um, IG pizza. We already mentioned this earlier. Um, you can always almost at parties, you can find a way to eat something. If you're in that need for food, you know, there's always a burger, no bun anywhere. There's always hot dog, no bun. There's always a salad you can get anywhere. Uh, take off the cheese of the pizza. Um, so it's very easy. You'll be able to manage this once you get more experience on it. Um, but yeah, it's very easy. There's no um, really hardships or hacks you need to follow or anything. Question two, do I ever measure my ketones? Um, again, mentioned this earlier in the slides. No, I, I don't really um, worry about my ketones too much. Um, they've been around 0.2 the times that I have measured them, but I can't tell you the last time I measured them. It's not really a big um, interest of mine at this point in my life. Question three, do you ever have a bad hypoglycemia? Um, I honestly couldn't tell you the last time I had one, again, the, the, the beauty of this low carb diet, almost the best part of it is that you remove the possibility of a roller coaster ride, which is I keep saying roller coaster ride, meaning, you know, blood sugars from 200 down to 50 um, when you overcorrect and, and stuff like that. So with the low carb diet, um, it obviously can happen. You know, you can get um, human error. You can add too much insulin by accident and whatnot. It just doesn't happen that often for me, uh, very rarely at the most. Um, and, a, and a bad hyperglycemia for me is probably in the 50s or 60s, which again, I'll take lipid glucose for and be normal in, in 10, 15 minutes. So this is probably the most common one. Why not just eat like everybody else and shoot for an A1C of 7%? And like I said, two of my biggest motivations are one, to live a normal, healthy life and have blood sugars as my non-diabetic friends or my non-diabetic family members. And two, to avoid complications. And with an A1C of 7%, like I showed you with an A1C of 6.5%, all the risk for complications are pretty much tremendously higher than if you were at an A1C, which I have right now at like 4.7%. Question five, what is your message to newly diagnosed families? Um, I guess my main one would be to order Dr. Bernstein's book, read through it. Um, this is something that you guys all have to go through together as a family. It makes it a lot easier for the child, especially if it's, you're dealing with a child with type one. Um, Support of the family is very important. Um, and again, read Dr. Bernstein's book. Thank you very much, everybody.